The Lenten Observance celebrates history's most intriguing and life-changing twin events, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God's Son. Although many people know much already about the events that surrounded His crucifixion and glorious rising from the dead, yet many still remain ignorant about the true and real meaning of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. It is for this reason I would like to present to you this special Shooter Word Passion Week series entitled The Myths and the Facts of the Death of Jesus. It is my hope and prayer that as you watch this special presentation and ponder about the truths presented here, you will understand your own need to put your personal faith in Jesus Christ as your only Lord and Savior. God bless you. Christ's death, though tragic, was neither unfortunate nor unexpected. On the contrary, it was deliberate and planned from eternity by His Father in heaven. Jesus Christ Himself knew of this plan and heartily submitted to it. His death was never an accident in the first place. Prophet Isaiah prophesying about the death of Jesus wrote, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Prophet Daniel prophesied the same thing. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one, that is referring to Christ, will be cut off and will have nothing. Jesus Christ himself, during his earthly ministry, knew perfectly as well that he would have to suffer and die for the sins of the people. We are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and plugged and crucified. Speaking of his eventual death and coming back to life, Jesus said, The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. Hence, when Judas Iscariot, the chief priests, and the temple guards came in Gethsemane to arrest him, Jesus didn't resist them. He humbly submitted to them, knowing that his time has come. Even at the cross, while crucified between two thieves, Jesus was never vengeful nor was he angry at them. He was understandably forgiving to those who were against him. The death of Jesus was actually his father's way and the only way by which the world can be saved from God's wrath and judgment. The book of 1 Corinthians 15, 3 says this, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Furthermore, in Revelation 5, 9, it also declares, because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. The death of Jesus and the subsequent shedding of his sinless blood from the cross was the very price Jesus paid to enable those who will believe in his death and resurrection escape God's wrath and his impending judgment against sin. There was absolutely nothing from this world that could save you and me except the sacrifice of Christ's life for us sinners. Not our righteous deeds, not our piety, not our good works and religion, commendable these things may be, but only through Christ's atoning and redeeming death at the cross in Calvary. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. He died so that we who are dead in our sins can receive life eternal and salvation. The beautiful fact about the Christ's Death was its objects, 
us. Christ died for you and me, for others as well, and actually for the whole world. And he did it out of love and compassion for our condition. We are sinners, unacceptable and unworthy before God. Yet, still Christ chose to give his sinless life for us who are drowning in our own mistakes and sins. That's the beauty about his death. The book of Romans 5, 6, and 8 says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. My message today is called Five Virtues of Christian Perfection. Five Virtues of Christian Perfection. So let's begin reading the book of Philippians in chapter 4. And I will read beginning in verse 1 to verse 3. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. I plead with Judea and I plead with Sintike to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, fellow yoke fellow, help these women who have contented at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of of life. The first virtue of Christian perfection. By the way, this is our aim, to be perfect. And to be perfect is not to be sinless. There is only one place where we can experience sinlessness, and that is when we finally get to the heavens. But while we are here on earth, we are definitely bound to commit sin and fall into all kinds of sinful pattern. This is the reason why there is repentance and this is the reason why God forgives. But to be Christ-like or to be Christian, uh, achieve Christian perfection is to be complete or to have the person of Jesus Christ manifested and revealed more and more in our lives. And there are five major virtues that we can see here in chapter 4 about Christian perfection. Number one is reconciliation. Reconciliation. O ang pagkakasundo. Paul said, I plead with you, Dia, and I plead with Sintike to agree with each other in the Lord. As you all know, brethren, that this is one of our aims, and this is one of our purposes, that in the church we must all be found in unity, because we are simply one body. And as one body, we must be together. As one body, we must be harmonious, and we must be united. We cannot have something against a brother we cannot have something against a sister. We cannot have an emotional, a negative emotion, a bad thought against a brother, against a sister, against even the leaders of the church, and expect ourselves to be united in the church. In the church, there should only be one mind and one heart. Of course, there is a room for disagreements because we are not robots here we are not eight automated machines here there is a room for agreement or disagreement but you must not be disagreeable you cannot come before the presence of the lord with anger you cannot come before the presence of the lord with hate with some form of animosity with anyone in the body of christ mark eleven twenty five to 26 let's take a look at that verse also when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, 
so that your Father in heaven may forgive you of your sins. So, it says there that we must uh, forgive those that have uh, erred against us. And so we need to understand right now that reconciliation is required before one could worship the Lord. It says that you must leave your gift. And so make sure that as you come here in the body of Christ, when you come before the presence of the Lord, if there's anything that you need to ask forgiveness for, make sure you do it. Whether it be a spat with your wife, with your husband, it could be... Uh, you have a disagreement with a brother, with a sister, make sure your heart is free from anger and free from any kind of hatred. We must always seek to be reconciled with God. Kailangan may pagkakasundo tayo sa Panginoon. We must seek to be reconciled. How should we reconcile? I'm going to give you three ways how we should reconcile. Ito po ang tatlong hakbang paano tayo magkaroon ng pakikipagkasundo sa ating mga kapatid. Three ways how should we be reconciled. Number one, we must forgive each other's sins just as God has forgiven our sins. We should forgive in the way God has forgiven our sins. Colossians chapter 3 verse 13. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. In other words, we should forgive the one who has offended us, the one who has upset us, and the one who has committed a serious error, a serious offense, a serious sin, a serious violation against us in the way God has forgiven us. Number two, we should not only forgive, but we should also forget. Forget the sin just as God has forgotten our own sins. The good thing about the Lord is He does not only forgive us, He does not only say, you are forgiven, but He removes, He extinguishes, and He blots out all our sins. In the book of Micah chapter 7 verse 19, it says there, You will again have compassion on us, and you will tread our sins underfoot, and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. That is where all our sins are. They are are now at the bottom of the ocean, never to be remembered, never to be uh, put into remembrance anymore. God has forgotten all our sins. Matthew 18, in verse 22, Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. 77 times, or 70 times seven. That's how much we must forgive. That's how much we must forget. And number three, how should we reconcile? We must accept the repentant just as God has accepted us. Accept the repentant just as God has accepted us. You must know not just to forgive and to forget, you must know how to accept that person back. You must not let him wallow. You must not let him remain in his sorrow. The Apostle Paul said, You ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. You must reaffirm. You must bring back. You must restore the love that was lost. And there is no perfect picture of being forgiven and his sins forgotten and once again accepted than the picture of the lost son or the prodigal son. Remember the story of the prodigal son? He took all his inheritance from his father and then went off living in a wild living. But eventually this man who had everything lost everything. He ended up 
feeding pigs. And he became so hopeless that there was nothing to eat except the very food for the pigs. And he came back to his senses. And oftentimes, people need to learn the lesson the hard way. They need to learn, to learn their lesson the hard way. They need to be slapped by God. They need to be uh, disciplined severely by God before they could learn their lesson. The prodigal son learned the lesson the hard way. From being a prince of the household, he became almost like a pig. But eventually, the grace of God shone upon him. He came back to his senses, and then he went back to his father and begged for his father's forgiveness. He said, Father, I have sinned against you and against heaven. Please, accept me. The father did not play hard to get. Hindi siya pinahirapan ng kanyang amain. The father accepted the son. And he said, My son who was lost is now found. My son who was dead is now alive. Bring in the fattened calf. Give him again the ring and the robe. And let's have some rejoicing. Let's have some partying. In order for us to be reconciled, with, any, with anyone in our lives or with anyone in the church, you must learn how to forgive. You must learn how to forget the sin. And you must once again accept each other. This is what God is giving to you right now. He is not pushing you away. God knows you have sinned. God knows that you have separated yourself from Him. God knows that you have doubted, but He is not pushing you away. Rather, He is offering you an invitation. God said, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. There is no sin that could forever keep you from God. No matter how big your sin is, no matter how huge your iniquities are, if you are willing to repent, the Bible says that God is just and faithful and He will cleanse us and forgive us of our sins. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ yet as your Lord and Savior, you have no reconciliation with Him. You are not yet reconciled with Him. You are probably a person of religion. You are probably a do-gooder. You are probably a moral person. You are not uh, some kind of a criminal. You are not an evil person. But nevertheless, you are still a sinner. And every sinner will eventually be condemned to eternal lake of fire. God will judge the sinner. But He will forgive the sinner who is repentant. And once you are forgiven, then God will accept you. And He will even put your name in the book of life. Just as the other workers that work with Paul were. Their names were in the book of life. Look at that in verse 3. Yes, and I ask you, yoke fellow, help these women who have contented at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life today. You don't need to say, oh, you know, no one can know if he is saved or not. There are even religious groups that say no one could ever tell, no one could ever know if one is saved or not. But that is a very ridiculous idea. As far as the Bible is concerned, right here, right now, in the present time, you can have life eternal. You can have your name written in the book of life. Because if your name is not in the book of life, there is only judgment waiting for you. In the book of Revelation, we read in Revelation chapter 20, in verse 11 to verse 15 says, I saw a great white throne, and him who seated on it, 
Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened. In other words, there are two sets of books in heaven. The books and the other book, which is called the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead. They were on it. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. The first death is physical death. But there is a second death wherein the spirit, the soul of man is cast into hell. If anyone's name, if anyone's name is not found in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Make sure today your name is in the book of life. If you have no full assurance, if you have no full confidence, you are just assuming, you are just guessing, you are just hoping, you are knocking on wood that somehow when your number is called, your name will be found in the book of life. If you have no confidence yet today, why don't you accept Christ? Why don't you recommit yourself to Christ and have your name written in the book of life? Amen. The first virtue of Christian perfection is reconciliation. Number two virtue is rejoicing. Rejoicing. Rejoice in the Lord always, and I say again, rejoice. Look at that in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord. How many among you are having the joy from the Lord today? Amen. To God be the glory. Turn to the one next to you and say, I have the joy of the Lord. Joy is the immediate result when one is forgiven and when one forgives. When you are forgiven, when you are forgiven, you will have joy. How many among you felt joy when somebody has forgiven you? Yeah. And that is also true if you forgive. If you forgive, you will also have joy and happiness in your life. The book of Luke chapter 10 verse 20, you can see that joy is or happiness is the immediate result when one is forgiven or when one forgives. Do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is our joy. Our joy is because God has forgiven us. Our joy is because God has forgotten all our sins. Our joy is because God has accepted us once again. This is where our joy is. That is why we have the joy of salvation. We have the joy of salvation. Do not put your mind on earthly things. Fill your minds with positive things. And last but not least, ungodly lifestyle. Yang buhay na hindi makajos. Ungodly, carnal, fleshly lifestyle. Look at that in verse 9. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. You need to follow the faithful example of the godly. Follow the example of the godly in the church. Follow the pattern of service. The way of living of the godly in the church. Mga kapatid, yan ang inyong sundan. Yan ang inyong tularan. The Lenten season celebrates two of history's most intriguing and life-changing events, the death and resurrection of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Although many people already know much about the events that surround His crucifixion and glorious rising of the dead, 
many remain ignorant about the true meaning of Christ's death and resurrection. The Sure Word Television Ministry together with the Pentecostal Missionary Church of Christ Fort Watch, would like to invite you to this coming Saturday, March 30, 2013, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We will be holding a very special performance directed by Sure Words TV's very own Pastor Jonathan Ferriol. Again, we want you to come. We want you to see the church, and we want to minister to you the unadulterated Word of God. If you need a ride, we can provide you a transportation. Just give us a call. The numbers are now flashing on the screen. So gather your neighbors, your friends, and your family and get ready for an inspiring presentation to be followed by an empowering message. Mark your calendars, March 30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. See you there. This program was made possible by the generous financial support of the PMCC Fort Watch U.S. District. Join us on Sunday in our first worship at 8 a.m. and our second worship at 10.30 a.m. We are located at 1019 West, 182nd Street, Gardena, California, 90248. For questions, counseling, and prayer requests, email us at info at or call us at 310-327-1300.